Hi, my name's John. Uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about my experiences learning Verilog uh, and FPGA uh, design, particularly um, for the Lattice ICE 40 series. Um, I've selected this series because um, you can develop using ICE Storms, which is an open source tool chain, um, and that, you know, as a hobbyist trying to get into it, suits me perfectly because I can use it in my existing tools like Vim and a terminal just to make and um, program that I'm used to. Uh, and I'm not learning a new interface, I'm probably learning the subject. Um, so I've I bought this ice stick a few years ago um, with the intention of learning FPGAs and Verilogs but as normal things come along that take my attention instead. Um, but what finally spurred me into doing this was reading about the uh, PicoSoc project uh, which is a, a system on a chip for a ICE40 um, chipset uh, with a, based on a RISC-V processor uh, and in particular Matt Venn did an interesting video on 2812 or WS2812 LEDs adding a peripheral to that uh, Pico sock um, which I found quite interesting uh, you know being able to roll your own peripherals adding peripherals and modules as and when you need them to a um, system on a chip so I started looking around and you know the first thing you sort of learn 101 of FPGAs is counters and flip-flops and that made me think about my binary clock uh, which is here, uh, I call this wooden bits. I developed this, um, yeah, again, a, f a few years ago, it was one of my first projects, um, learning microcontrollers and programming. Uh, and yeah, this has got an embedded uh, microcontroller, a, a at Mega 328, um, and it's running a C program, embedded C that I wrote. And it, it, you know, it works very well, um, it's quite a reliable system. Um, but what I've realised since developing it is that a binary clock is essentially a frequency divider. So if I press the button to set it, which advances the speed, um, you can see that this cell, or this cell here, is flashing at half the frequency of that cell below it, and that one's half the frequency of that one. And that works in digital design. Using flip-flops, you can essentially create a frequency divider by feeding the data line of one flip-flop into the clock of the next one in series, and then you'll divide down by two each one as you do that. Um, as you go along, and to create a binary clock like this, a a or a, uh, a BCD, a decimal coded binary, binary, sorry, um, you can then create a modulo counter by uh, using some logic and AND gate to drive the reset on a flip flop uh, at the bits of when it's just about to go into ten, because uh, obviously otherwise it would count up to fifteen with four bits a nibble. This is just one of the routines I have. I'll go into this as well. That you know, I realised doing this project that there are bits which are good for FPGAs, you know, the low level really fast hardware driving like the WH2812 peripheral and there's bits which like the user interface which are nicer done in, in programming um, like in language like C, so I put it up on a processor. Um, but yeah, the, the Pico stock is something quite interesting I think because you can create the peripheral and then run C code on top of it. Uh, and it, it was a really useful in that sense as well, is, you know, reminding and cementing what's actually going on when you're accessing a register address um, in some embedded C or whatever embedded system you're developing for. So I, I touched on these WS2812 LEDs a bit, but um, this, as I said, this has a WS2812 LEDs and they're these single wire LEDs um, and they run in a sort of snakes and ladder system through the clock. Um, and they, they're great because they reduce the complexity of um, the hardware and the driving hardware because all you need is a single data line coming out of a microcontroller you know maybe with a resistor to any to current limit in case of any um, short circuits or anything but other than that it's very simple but it comes at a cost of uh, the processor overhead uh, because it's essentially sending out a stream of 24-bit colors for every single LED in the in the, uh, in the on the wire uh, and it sends those, out, those bits out in series based on, so sending a high or a low bit based on the uh, modulating the period of the um, of the signal and it has to do that with very precise timing because it's, I think it runs at 400 uh, hertz or kilohertz sorry um, and that generally works because microcontrollers won't have a peripheral designed specifically for doing that you'll have to use a timer and an overflow count, um, and compare match interrupts to you know toggle that pin um, just after the right period has elapsed. And when you have, you know, this has only got 16 LEDs, but if you have more LEDs and you've basically got 16 times, or well, for this clock, you've got 16 times 24 bits having to be sent out on that data stream 
um, every update, which is I think at 384 bits, um, you know, and you're basically interrupting and uh, chopping up your cycles um, every time that bit has to be sent out. And it's fine for a simple clock like this, but you know, more sophisticated projects that can really become difficult. It's always good to start with a simulation or a drawing of what you're trying to achieve doing any sort of design, but with um, FPGAs, it's very important. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, a binary clock you can achieve um, with frequency dividers based on uh, D-type flip-flops. So I've got this simulation running in Falstad of a uh, full 24 hour with seconds uh, binary, de decimal coded binary um, clock. So the left hand <coughs> side is the uh, least significant digits and least significant bit. So this is one, two, uh, four, eight and it would be the ones of seconds and then the tens of seconds up here. And basically you drive the first flip-flop with the clock uh, and then by having the not data, driving the data pin, you then halve that clock rate. So this would be two hertz, you get one hertz at uh, Q out. And then not Q can then drive the uh, clock of the next one, that's gonna halve again. Um, so you'll get uh, yeah, half the frequency um, so if you run it, you don't see this one flashing. Uh, I think I actually it grinds my laptop to a halt. I'm sort of running it at advanced speed, so uh, you don't really see the uh, LEDs flashing quite at the right rate. But um, it's useful. If I slow it down. Yeah, so now you can see this one. Well, actually, they're flashing on and off, but it's more what you should be seeing. Um, and then I've added the uh, first bit or bit one, if that's bit zero, and uh, bit three, which would be 10, um, adding to form the reset. Um, and these are modeled as uh, synchronous flip flops. So they will reset as soon as the reset edge appears, not when a reset is clocked in. Uh, and that's quite important uh, when it comes to design the Verilog. Um, because to emulate that you have to uh, write the code to react on both the clock edge and on the reset edge. If you do it just on the clock edge, which is how I did it originally, you ha would have to add bits uh, 0 and 3 uh, to make 9, because uh, 9 will then appear uh, and then it will get reset on the next edge, which would be trying to clock to 10. Um, but the problem with that is that then when you're driving the uh, reset of the next, or well, sorry, the clock of the next digit, that clock will appear at nine and the edge will clock it when it's on nine rather than when it's on, you know, rolling over into 10. Um, so you'd have to have some sort of latch here, which clocks with that clock, um, which you can, you could, I did do in Verilog originally, I had a sort of carry bit, but, um, I think it's nice to design them as synchronous like this simulation uh, is running. Yeah, so then it's very much the same for each digit really, apart from this is on five uh, or six, the bits it's handing. Uh, but you just keep driving the clock with each, the output, the last, um, the reset of the last module. Uh, and this can be done with wires, bit logic wires in uh, Verilog, as I'll show you in a minute. Here's the module that I designed um, to represent each of the digits in the um, Falstad model that I just showed you. Um, so it's called it counter. It's you know one of the first. It's very basic. One of the first things you'll learn when you're learning FPGA design and Verilog. Um, so it's got an input clock and input reset like the flip flops, and then an output digit, which is the number of dig uh, of um, the value digit you want to represent. So the number of bits you need for that. And by default, it's four because the clock shows nibbles um but uh just if you, you know to make it more efficient because you don't actually need uh four bits to show the sort of tens of minutes and the tens of hours you just need uh you know it's going to be five for tens of minutes so that's three bits and two for the tens of hours so that's just two bits um you can change that there and the you know the bits of the digit are like the wires of of q on the flip-flops so you'd have four wires and it's a synchronous design, so it's going to act on both the positive edge of clock and the positive edge of reset. Uh, and then it's simply, you know, if, if reset's asserted, then the digit goes to zero. Otherwise, just increment the digit. And then if we look at how that's 
I've implemented that in the main top module. Uh, I've got a binary clock wire, which is some logic based on whether the button's pressed or not. So if the button's not pressed, then it's this um, external pin, which I'm driving with an external bench um, clock source of one hertz. Uh, if the button is pressed, then it will go to this internally uh, generated clock based on a divider um, running at two kilohertz. And yeah, if we look at the clock, um, so that, that clock source is then driving the clock input of the first, the, the zeros of seconds. Uh, and then you've got a reset wire, which is the a bit logic of um, the first and third bits, which would be 10, or a reset flag, which so I can um, clear the modules at the start and you know, they don't get them into a known state. Uh, and then the next module, just like the Falstad um, design, the, the logic diagram I showed, will um, the next module, the clock source, is the actual reset wire of the previous one. Uh, and then it has its own reset wire, which is uh, one, the first bit and the second bit, so it represents six. And then it just keeps going like that. So the reset of the next of so the minutes, the, the zeros of minutes is the, sorry, the clock source of the zeros of minutes is the reset of the previous. And you keep building up to get the hours. Um, and this works, if I run the test bench, you can see uh, this works correctly. It counts zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. That one will come to one. Uh, so then you've got 10, and that's the intended design, really, you know, counting seconds. So then as it gets to, uh, sorry, that's the minutes there, I think I've zoomed in a bit too much. But um, as it gets to 59 minutes for seconds, it will then increment the next, so that'll be uh, one minute. Let me zoom back in again. Um, and this works because, of the, because it is a synchronous um, flip-flop or uh, module design. Um, when I first started, I designed it to be asynchronous. So I can show you that as well, just by deleting this positive edge um, on that module. And uh, if you now rerun the test bench, or before I do that, I'll just show you as well that the interesting thing is, is that you don't, you don't see that um, reset wire uh, on the timing diagram at all. Uh, and that's essentially because it's, for all intents and purposes, instantaneously, um, being read by the wiring logic um, as the you know the reset to this module and also the clock source to that module. Uh, it's literally just some logic gates being wired together and, and driving these inputs. And it is, you know, in theory that's instantaneous uh, and that's one of the unique things about FPGA coding that uh, on each edge the, the variables are, are changing at the same time essentially. Um, in reality obviously the physics Electrons take time to move around um, hardware, so the, you know, the timing isn't 100% instantaneous, and you can create timing issues relying on that. And if this was more complex, and you, you know, you could have bugs relying on that, but um, because you can't see, I mean, if there's a high enough resolution, obviously there would be a very slight um, clock edge there. Uh, but yeah, we can't see it with this test bench. But if we go back and um, rerun it in asynchronous mode refresh it now you can actually see that reset pulse and that's because the reset isn't going to be read um, and and you know utilized until that module clocks that in so it'll go 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and then 10 a um, read reset and reset the digit or oh, sorry um, it will it'll actually reset uh, so, so because the reset is at 10 Reset gets asserted when bits uh, one and three become high, um, and then on the next clock edge, it's going to read that reset is set and clear it. Uh, but the problem is, is that the module in front, because that clock source is the reset uh, wire, the is going to just act on the first positive edge it sees, and so it'll clock one uh, effectively count ahead of the previous module, so it's sort of out of one one count out of phase. Um, and you might think, oh, well, you can easily fix that just by uh, changing it to nine uh, when it, the reset wire. So if I then run it and refresh, it just remains out of phase because it's still, um, you know, it's still having to clock this reset in, and that. But, but the reset will be asserted as soon as these digits, as soon as the digit nine appears, um, which will be on the edge of that module. But yeah, if we go back and look at the rest of the um, code, so I've got all these modules wired together. I've got a little LED um, driving. If you have a look at the um, 
it's just an array of LED, uh, the LED pins on the ice stick, just so that you can see um, the seconds counting when it's running, just in case the uh, WS2812s aren't working, for some reason you know the actual hardware is still operating, the code's working. Uh, then I've just, you know, a basic clock divider, generating some internal clocks, this is a internal one hertz clock for development when I didn't have the external clock source, and then this is the one running a thousand times that rate, um, then this is all the LED um, set up of registers, um, you know, the RGB registers and then a wire to create the display RGB. Um, an LED matrix wire which is reordering the bits of the digits into a sort of snakes and ladder arrangement which is how the wiring works in the clock. If you look at the cursor it kind of goes through like that. Um, and yeah, that's just simply because the, the string is addressed 0 to 15. Uh, but it's not running in that order based on the you know the nibbles uh, in the clock just for the ease of assembly, um, and then it's a basic sort of state machine um, based on whether the buttons pressed. If the buttons pressed, it will go red to show that you're in setting mode. Uh, the midday and midnight cycle, which is a sort of rainbow effect, um, that's achieved just by doing a nor on the the digits because um, if they're all zero, then it's midnight or uh, if it's 12 o'clock, then it's 12 and nor um, minutes. And then the standard color, which is white. And that just gets set down here. So the color's set based on those states. And then it will get set based on whether the um, bit is set in the LED matrix. Just a masking, it will set that LED color or it will just set it off. Here's the clock running on the bench then. Um, so I've hooked up the ice stick to the WS2812s, taking out the um, PCB that I normally have in here with that Mega running uh, with an RTC and C embedded software. Um, so it's running off this external clock source, the one hertz, and you can see if I press the set button, you see on a bit of breadboard, so I've hooked up some breadboard. Um, Chance red to show you it's setting time just like the C code does. Uh, it's not quite as nice as I was saying that uh, you know, there are certain things best done in FPGA, certain things done in software, things like the user interface, much easier to achieve uh, polish in that. Uh, things like, you know, having a slight wait before advancing the time or being able to, you know, advance a single minute, it's quite hard in this, uh, with this system. But yeah, it works for all intents and purposes, you can see it running a thousand times as fast. But um, with the external clock source, just driving a pin, you can also quite easily uh, drive just change the clock source of the frequency generator um, which is quite interesting so if I clock it up you'll see it starts to advance at a faster rate um, so if we go up to 100 Hertz and it really demonstrates the kind of frequency divider idea that you can see that that freak that's the fastest flashing LED on the display and then the one above it's flashing at half the rate, and then the one above that, half the rate of that one. Um, and if I run it at one kilohertz, for example, it, you know, it's running much faster. You saw the rainbow effect just then at midday and midnight. Uh, and then, you know, 50 or 10 kilohertz, and then even 100 kilohertz. You, know, you can't, you can barely see the um, minutes flashing now, uh, only really the hours. All right, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I've certainly learned a lot about FPJs, what not to do with FPJs, and what to do with FPJs. Uh, I'm looking forward to trying out some other uh, display driving systems as well. Okay, thanks. Bye.